for our final video in chapter 12, we're going to discuss exactly what's happening at the molecular level, which is what reaction mechanisms are all about, and then touch a little bit on catalysts in 12.7. Uh, but first, 12.6 reaction mechanisms. This is what the world of organic chemistry is really all about, diving deeply into these. But right now, we're just going to see what they mean at a surface level. Because we've seen rate laws in chemical equations, which tell us you know, what's happening and the effect on concentration. But it doesn't tell us anything about the specifics of how a reaction is actually proceeding. But looking at the reaction mechanism does that where we see the process exactly how a reaction occurs, what's moving where. That could happen in one step, could happen in several steps. So let's look at an example, one of these on slide 64 here. We're looking at an overall reaction of the conversion of ozone to oxygen, okay, O3 going to O2. As you see, there's six oxygen atoms on each side. It's a balanced equation there on the bottom. Yeah, but two O3s don't directly form three O2s. Okay? So how does it happen? Okay? It's a stepwise process for what's shown above the line here. Okay? First, we have an ozone that splits into O2 and a monatomic oxygen there. And that monatomic oxygen combines with another ozone to form two oxygen molecules. Okay? So it's two steps that add together to form the overall reaction at the bottom here with these monatomic oxygens canceling each other out. Just like when we stacked equations using Hess's law in chapter five, right? If it appears on the left and the right side, it's the same thing, we cross it out. It doesn't appear in the overall reaction. Yeah. And when we are breaking those reactions down into the individual steps, those steps are called elementary reactions, which is an important concept, elementary reaction. And when we're looking at an elementary reaction, it means that it occurs exactly as it's written. We can't simplify it any further. Yeah. So down at the bottom there, this is not an elementary reaction. We simplify them, these reactions, right? break them down into their individual steps when we're looking at mechanisms. So this is an elementary reaction. This is an elementary reaction occurring exactly as written. And what we're going to introduce on the next slide, but I'm going to show right here on 64, is a chemical intermediate. Okay. A chemical intermediate is something that is produced in one step and then consumed in another step of a reaction. And that's what this monatomic oxygen is. Okay. It gets produced in step one here and then taken up in step two. So it doesn't appear in the overall reaction. Okay. And you should be able to look at mechanisms and identify an intermediate, okay? So a chemical intermediate, something that's produced in one step, consumed in another, and therefore they always cancel out and don't appear in the overall reaction, okay? So the big takeaway here should be the fact that those overall reactions that we've been using in Gen Chem 1 and thus far this semester, sometimes they're an elementary reaction, but more often than not, they don't give us the whole picture for the mechanism, exactly how they occur. So let's think about these elementary reactions a little bit further. So there's two types I want you to know. First type is called a unimolecular elementary reaction. And you can kind of get an idea from the name there, unimolecular, one molecule. A unimolecular reaction just has one reactant. So it's that reactant, and it does something to form products. And typically, these unimolecular elementary reactions is one of several overall reactions and a mechanism. Okay. There are situations where it could be the overall reaction, okay, but other situations where it's not. Okay. So if that situation, right, if the unimolecular reaction, one molecule, one reactant, okay, then the rate is just equal to the rate constant times the concentration of A, because nothing can change that. So this is what I was hinting at way back in video two, right? where I told you you can't determine a rate law just by looking at the reaction. Okay? They have to be determined experimentally using the method of initial rates, which is correct. 
unless you're told specifically that it's a unimolecular elementary reaction. If that's not specified, you can't assume it. But if you're told that it's unimolecular, then the rate is just equal to the rate constant times the concentration of that one reactant, A in this case. So here on slide 67, we see an example of a unimolecular reaction. This is cyclobutane splitting into two molecules of ethylene. Okay. And it's only the concentration of cyclobutane, this reactant here on the left, that affects the reaction. It's just one step, you can't simplify it any further. Put some energy into the system and it happens. Okay. How does it happen? Well, remember, every reaction has to go through a transition state. That's why we need that energy to overcome the energy barrier, the activation energy, and reach the products. So we start with cyclobutane. We reach our transition state right, where this bond is breaking, this bond is breaking. We have some double bonds that are forming on the left and right. All of that's happening in the transition state. And then we get our products. Yep. So the decomposition of cyclobutane there is a unimolecular elementary reaction. Okay. We also have bimolecular elementary reactions. Okay. Bimolecular means two molecules. So there are two types of bimolecular, depending on if the molecules are the same or if they're different. Okay. Here on top, two different molecules, A and B, coming together to form products. Okay. In that situation, the rate is first order with respect to A and B. Okay, so rate is equal to K times concentration of A times concentration of B, which you can tell by looking at the reaction if you're told it's an elementary reaction. The other type, bimolecular, where the reactant is the same, means it's second order with respect to that reactant. Okay, so rate is equal to Ka squared. Second order with respect to A. Both of them are second order overall. Again, could be a whole reaction, could be just part of an overall more complex mechanism. The decomposition of hydrogen iodide here, HI, is a bimolecular elementary reaction. If I were to write the overall reaction, it would be 2HI over here right, going to H2 plus I2. This is the bottom type, jumping back a slide here. Right? That's this type, bimolecular with respect to the same reactant. HI in this case, hydrogen iodide. Two molecules come together, they collide, they're in a transition state, and then we get our products, hydrogen and iodine. There are other examples with more molecules, right? Termolecular, three molecules, tetramolecular, four molecules, etc. Right? But those are much less common. With a bimolecular reaction, we need two molecules to come together. Think about collision theory, right? They have to collide, they have to have the right orientation, they have to have the proper energy. Termolecular, tetramolecular reactions for, would require three or four of those things to happen all at the same time. It would be like three people throwing a basketball in the air and trying to get all three basketballs to collide exactly at the same time. It's hard to do. So those aren't common. There's not something that would be tested in this course. Okay. But we do need to be able to relate mechanisms to rate laws, both determining the rate law from an elementary reaction, like we've already talked about, but also looking at an overall reaction mechanism and determining the rate law for the reaction. Okay. Because if you have a multi-step reaction, right, two, three, four, five steps, not all of the steps are occurring at the same speed, okay? which means a reaction can't proceed faster than the slowest step. It's always something that's lagging behind. It's like if you were running in track a four by 400 and you know, one of your teammates was a sloth or a turtle. It doesn't matter how fast you go, the team is always going to be limited by that slow member of the team. And re reaction mechanisms have the same thing. Okay. One step that's slower than the rest, and slows the whole thing down. Okay. It's called the rate determining step, which you'll see referred to as the RDS, rate determining step. Okay. And it could be any step of a multi-step reaction. It could be the first step, could be the last step, could be one of the ones in the middle. So you have to determine what it is experimentally. 
But if you are told what the slow step is, um, you can determine the overall reaction mechanism. Okay? Here on the bottom, we have an overall reaction. Okay? But that reaction is made up of two steps, two bimolecular elementary reactions here. Uh, knowing that the first step is slow and the second step is fast, well, it's only the concentration of the slow steps that controls the overall reaction. Okay? So I can write a rate law for this overall reaction. Okay? And it has nothing to do with the overall reaction. I have to have a stepwise mechanism and be told what the slow step is. But if I know the slow step there, now I can take the fact that I know this is the slow step Okay. And I know it's an elementary reaction because when we're given reaction mechanisms, they're always elementary reactions. And I can write the rate law for this reaction. Okay. It's always rate is equal to K. And then it's the concentrations of the, whatever the reactants are in the slow steps. Okay. So one slow step here, the reactants are NO2. Okay. There are two of them, right? So rate is equal to the rate constant times NO2 there are two reactants, so it's a bimolecular elementary reaction, second order with respect to NO2. So the rate is equal to K NO2 squared. And, and notice you can't get that from looking at the overall reaction, because if you look at the overall reaction, there's only a single NO2 there. But the reaction mechanism itself gives us a lot more information. Okay? If I know what the slow step is, I can look just at that one step set the rate law equal to the concentration of the reactants, and then you're in business. So there are also, oh, let me get rid of my annotating tools here. Uh, there are also rate determining steps involving equilibria, those are page 699 to 700 in your textbook, much more complex, not something you need to worry about, okay? but something where you're given just simple forward reactions like this, breaking down into a mechanism, you should be able to identify the rate determining step, right? it's the slow one, that's easy, and write a rate law from that. So let's finish this video with 12.7, which is catalysis. Just a brief discussion on what catalysts are and how they work. Okay? We've introduced this idea already, knowing that they can speed a reaction up. Okay? And they do so by lowering the activation energy. Okay? They also, are regenerated in the process. So while they can participate in the reaction and change form temporarily, they always get spit back out. Okay, so you add a catalyst to a reaction and it comes back out. Right, the catalytic converter in your car doesn't eventually run out of catalyst because it regenerates. Yeah, of course, assuming no problems with the vehicle. So there are a lot of reactions that only occur because they'd be so slow otherwise when we introduce a catalyst. So you need to not only know what a catalyst is and the fact that it lowers activation energy, provides a new pathway, but also detect them from both a reaction coordinate diagram and a reaction pathway given a mechanism. Okay. So here's a reaction coordinate diagram. Right? If you see that the activation energy was lowered, but the, pro the reactants and the products are the same, that smaller hill, smaller activation energy, it means that an alternate pathway was introduced, meaning it must be done with a catalyst. And the neat thing about catalysts, right, is that catalysts can involve extra steps. Here and in the uncatalyzed pathway, it's just one big step. The catalyst has two steps here, but it's still lower energy and easier to do those two steps quickly. So catalysts might have more steps, but they're still faster overall. And you'll notice that catalysts also increase the speed going both directions, reactants to products. If you were to go products back to reactants, it's still a smaller energy barrier than the uncatalyzed one. So catalysts increase the speed of a reaction going both directions. Okay. So if you look at a reaction coordinate diagram, you should be able to quickly tell which one uses a catalyst. Well, it's the one with the smaller activation energy. Okay. So the one on the right here. If you're asked about a specific step, which one's catalyzed, it's whichever one went down in activation energy. 
So here the second curve stays the same. First step went down. That's so it's the first step of the reaction. Oh, sorry, that is catalyzed, right? Step one here, the activation energy went down. That's the one that got catalyzed. We go step one and then step two. That's an intermediate there at that valley. And to finish, there are two types of catalysts that I want you to be familiar with, a homogeneous catalyst and a heterogeneous catalyst. That comes down to the phase, the catalyst. A homogeneous catalyst is present in the same phase as the reactant, okay? meaning if you were in a solution, the catalyst is in the solution. If you're in the gas phase, the catalyst is in the gas phase. The catalyst then reacts with the reactants to form an intermediate. And when that intermediate breaks down, it makes the product and spits the catalyst back out. That's what's used in your bodies. In this situation, we have catalyzed, cat, uh, excuse me, catalysts, right, to speed along these reactions to go from glucose and generate energy. We also have heterogeneous catalysts, which, right, just like a heterogeneous mixture, present in a different phase than the reactants. Heterogeneous catalysts are typically solid, right, and they provide an active surface for the reaction to occur. I just mentioned catalytic converter in your car a minute ago. That's what the catalytic converter is. Yeah? It converts carbon monoxide and oxygen, right, or sorry, carbon monoxide with oxygen to produce CO2, much more friendly for the environment, via redox catalysis, okay, platinum in a solid surface, heterogeneous catalyst. Okay? It just gives a surface for the reaction to occur. Reactant needs to stick to the surface needs to be activated, needs to react, and then it needs to leave the product. Okay. Don't worry as much about the steps, they're kind of intuitive, just know the difference between a homogeneous catalyst and a heterogeneous catalyst. Yep. That's pretty simple to do. So know how to identify from a reaction coordinate diagram if a catalyst is present, if you see the activation energy go down. If you see something get introduced in the very first step of a reaction, and then spit back out all the way at the end. So it's introduced in the first step and regenerated in the final step. That's also a catalyst if you're looking at the mechanism. And then of course, know everything that we covered in 12.6, and then you'll be good to wrap up chapter 12.